Well, that's certainly our hope. I um, would like to read a very familiar passage of Scripture that uh, gives us, I believe, a key to stronger faith that will help us to see what it is we need to see so that we'll be moved the way we should be moved to reach out to the lost as the Lord calls us to do. And I'd like to read um, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 15 through 21, but the main verse I want us to see, of course, is verse 18. Let me begin by reading that, beginning in verse uh, 15. We read this, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening and may he help us also to receive what it is he has to tell us. Now again, we're, we're continuing uh, in a series of devotions in the hopes that perhaps the Lord will strengthen us a bit, show us what it is we need to be doing so that we'll have, again, more power, more strength to be able to do his will. Uh, we know, I think it's pretty clear as Christians, that the Lord has given to us a special responsibility, uh, a special task. He's given us a treasure. It's called the gospel. And he wants us to share that gospel with others. Now, the fact this is true is one of the reasons why we watched the series that we did uh, by Alistair Begg on uh, basically the topic of with Christ in the school of evangelism and discipleship. Why would we want to be with Christ in that school, why would we want to learn from him except that we might learn from the master how we might do this most effectively? And that's also why we're following up on this series because we did see certain things that would be helpful for us to be able to do to share Christ with others. We, we do need to understand where the power to do this comes from. So we want to keep this responsibility continually before our eyes because this is the purpose of the church. But we also want to, by his grace, be a little bit better equipped, perhaps, to do it. We need to get the message out so that people will be saved. But we've seen that to do this effectively, we need the right kind of motivation. The Lord's given to us several, as we've seen, any one of which by itself should be enough to move us to reach out to the lost. Now, I'm not going to rehearse all of them, but I do want to mention that I've already mentioned one. It is a responsibility that the Lord has entrusted to us. But I do want us to remember that it's not just a responsibility. It is a great honor. I think you heard me say this morning, and I, I believe it's true. If the Lord, uh, he could have given this work to the angels. And the angels would gladly have taken that responsibility. They would have done it with all their heart and with all their strength and they would glory in it because it is such a high honor and privilege. As a matter of fact, uh, there's no higher honor that God could bestow on anyone than to be the ambassadors of his grace. But he didn't give it to the angels. He gave this responsibility to us. Now again, this reminds us why it is that God made us in the first place is that we might glorify him. It reminds us of why it is that he saved us and called us to this position that we might make him known, and particularly his grace. I mean, the Lord hasn't sent us with a message of judgment, 40 days and then the world's going to be destroyed, but a message of redemption, how somebody can receive the grace of God and be saved from their sins, be saved from the consequences of their sins, how they can go uh, to be with the Lord in heaven forever and enjoy the, that blessed world of perfect love and happiness. Uh, this reminds us that we do need a greater love for him to push forward to become more like the one who saved us. But it also reminds us again why we need to get the message out because there are people who are in danger. 
We need to get the message out so that others will know of his love and his mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ so that our family members might live and not perish, so that our friends might come to know him and our neighbors, that they might be saved from their sins and begin to live for what they were actually created for in the first place as well, which is to worship him, not only here, but one day before the throne in heaven. And while they're here, that they too might join us in the great privilege of sharing this message for others or to others. So these are the reasons why the Lord has made us. But again, we also saw that in order for these things really to have any value to us, any, any substance, any reality, in order to move us the way that they should move us, we do need to believe that they're true. We need to have faith. And I think sometimes this is actually what stops us. When we get to the point where we're going to run the risk of appearing to be fools in the eyes of the world for the sake of Christ, perhaps we begin to doubt. The enemy certainly can come in and he can stop us at that particular point. We need faith. We need stronger faith. As we saw last week, the author to the Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 11 verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Uh, the thing that faith is able to do for us is to show us the things that we don't yet have, the things that are still being hoped for, the things that are not yet in front of us, those things which God has promised, those things which God has told us to be true, uh, those things which he tells us are true for the unbeliever, that there is a hell that they're going to have to suffer in. We don't see that. We don't see heaven. But faith makes those things accessible to us. We are able to apprehend them. We are able to see them. We are able to trust God so that these things actually, even though they're far off or perhaps not as far off as we think, are much uh, nearer. We see them as true. Now, the one thing we need to understand is the only reason why any have served the Lord throughout history is because they believed what he said. Nobody's ever served the Lord who hasn't believed. And the reason why some have served him with a greater effort than others is that they were more firmly convinced that these things are true, that the gospel is true, that people are going to perish without the gospel, that they need to hear it in order to be saved. Now, if we are believers, if we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, we already have faith. We already believe what God says. If we didn't believe it, uh, we wouldn't have put our trust in Christ in the first place. But I think we also understand that faith can be stronger or it can be weaker depending on one thing. And that is how powerfully the Spirit of God is actually working within our souls. The, the stronger He is within us, the stronger our faith is going to be. But the weaker his influence is in our souls, the weaker our faith is going to be. Now this is at least one of the reasons why the Lord commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Again, Ephesians 5, verse 18. Paul says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. If we are filled with the Spirit, not only will we have greater strength to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do, but we'll have a stronger faith. We'll be able to see the reality of the things that the Lord tells us in His Word much more clearly. And we'll have then a stronger motivation to put a greater effort into doing what the Lord calls us to do, which is primarily uh, to reach the lost. Now, since... This particular command is the key. I, I thought it would be good for us to consider how we might better be able to obey this command. Now, we do need to understand that there are two parts to this command. The first is, Paul says, we are not to be drunk with wine. The second is, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, he says we are not to be drunk with, with wine. Now, it may be true that Paul chose that particular sin of drunkenness because it was something that the Ephesians were particularly liable to, particularly tempted to. 
I think we have to understand drunkenness is a sin that virtually every culture, every society throughout history has been prone to. And just because we are believers, just because we have the Spirit of God within us, just because we have faith, doesn't mean that we're not going to be tempted along with the rest of mankind to get drunk. Now, the Lord gave us wine. He gave us strong drink in order to be a blessing to us when we need it. There's nothing wrong with, with alcohol as long as we use it responsibly. But we also know that as is true of many of God's gifts, it's possible to get too much of a good thing. I mean, even food is a good thing. We can get too much food. Uh, we can get too much entertainment so, or rest or recreation. And, you know, there's a, there's a continuum. There's like this uh, area where this, this much is good, but too much is, is not good. And certainly that is true of alcohol. But now we do need to understand Paul... I believe has something more in mind here than simply the consumption of alcoholic beverages because of what he contrasts it with, because of what he commands us to do on the other hand. He says we are not to get drunk with wine, but we are to be filled with the Spirit. I think what he's doing is he is pointing to wine as perhaps a premier example of something that has the ability to control us if we let it control us. We are not to be drunk or filled with too much wine because when we are, that is what influences us. That's what controls us. I mean, just think about the last time that you may have seen somebody who was inebriated, somebody who was drunk. You understand that alcohol has the ability dramatically to alter the way that a person behaves. And it does not alter it generally for good, but in a negative way. Now, if we look at it in this way, we understand that Paul's basically telling us here that, that there are many things that can control us, but we are not to be under their control. We are to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. We are not to be under the control of things that can strongly influence our behavior in a negative way, in a way other than what the Lord wants. Now, what are these things? What are these influences? They can basically be boiled down into two categories, the flesh and the world. And we know we do have three enemies, right? We have the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I didn't include the devil because the devil uses the flesh and the world against us. So these are the things we need to be aware of as far as not allowing them to control us. We need to resist them. We need to fight against them. Well, what are these things? Well, first of all, the flesh. It, it includes those, any really, any desire, all desires that are in our hearts that are opposed to the Spirit of God, opposed to what it is He wants us to do, the direction that He would lead us. But Paul gives us a partial list of what some of these desires are in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. I'm not going to explain what all these are. I think we probably have a good understanding of what they are to begin with. He says this, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence or control of the flesh. Basically, if we are, Paul tells us, it will ultimately destroy us. If we look at Ephesians 5.18 in this light, we can basically replace the word wine with any of these things, and I believe that it is equally true. Paul says, I mean, for instance, taking just a few examples, he says, do not be filled with jealousy, but be filled with the Spirit. Do not desire immoral things, but desire the things of the Spirit. Do not be controlled by anger, but be controlled by the Spirit. 
Uh, the scripture talks about anger is something that can fill us and when it fills us it controls us those who are filled with anger filled with rage are out of control we are not to be filled with anger we are not to be under its control we are to be under the control of the Holy Spirit we are to be filled with the Spirit under his control so the things of the flesh are the things that we are not to be under the control of to the degree that we are to that degree that we are weakened but we do need to understand that there are things that are outside of us. By the way, I should mention all of us have the remnants of the flesh. All of us have that old man, if I can put it that way, that old nature, that corruption that is still inside of us that is called the flesh that we need to resist. All of us are tempted in all of these areas to some degree and in some of these areas to a higher degree. We need to resist them. But as I've said, there are things that are outside of us, the things that are in this world, that Satan uses to stir up the desires of the flesh, that stir up these passions in order to bring us under their control. And let me just give you a couple of examples there. Uh, money is one. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, Paul doesn't say money is the root of, of all sorts of evil. He says the, the love of money. And just look at the world around us. We have plenty of examples of those who have destroyed other people's lives, who have cheated, lied, and stealed in order to have more money because they they believe if they have more money they're going to have more fun they're going to have more pleasure they'll be able to buy more things and have more things from the world things which we know uh, will not bring happiness we know Jesus actually ran into somebody in his ministry that was very much under the control of money and wealth so much so that he was unable because unwilling to give them up to follow Jesus. Jesus warns us against falling into the same trap. After the rich young ruler couldn't give up his possessions because they had control of him, control of his heart. Jesus, we read in Mark 10, verses 23 through 25, looking around said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And, and why is it so difficult for a rich man to enter? It's because he's unable to give up his idol, which is his wealth. The rich young ruler was not able to do it. Now, God will allow us to have money. He will allow us to have possessions. He will allow us to have wealth unless that wealth takes possession of our hearts. And then he will tell us we need to get rid of them. Or as his children, he'll make sure that we don't have that. He'll keep it away from us if he knows it is a temptation that will stumble us. We need to beware of the love of money. Another thing in the world that we need to make sure we're not under the control of is the desire for honor and recognition because that can do exactly the same thing. How many people have destroyed themselves trying to be popular in the world? Jesus says in John 5, verse 44, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? the one usurps the other. If we seek for that honor that comes from the world, then we really, he says, how can you really believe? How can you believe that God exists, the kingdom of heaven exists, the gospel is real? How can you believe when God tells you you ought to be seeking the honor from him and not to be seeking the honor of men, that you're seeking the honor of men instead? How can you truly believe if that's the case with you? If you truly believe in the Lord, you know the honor that comes from men is only temporary, but the honor that comes from God is that which lasts forever, and that's what we need to be seeking. So we are not to desire the world. We are not to be drunk with the world or the things of the world. We do need to remember our Lord Jesus Christ loves us. 
He's taken us into relationship with himself. As a matter of fact, the Lord says he is, well, we are his bride. He is our husband, and we are married to him. If we leave him to go after other loves, that is the same as committing adultery on a spiritual level, which is why James writes in James 4, verse 4, and he's writing to believers who have fallen into the snare, apparently, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Paul tells us if we are to be filled with the Spirit, we need to be on our guard against these things that can control us, that can take possession of our hearts, that can influence us to this degree. We must not let them control us. We need to fight against them. Now, one thing that we need to be very thankful for is if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can never be completely under the control of the world or our flesh because the Spirit of God won't allow it. The Spirit of God is in there resisting that. He is a principle of love that is moving us towards the things that God wants us to have and away from the things of the world. And as long as that desire is inside of us, we can't entirely give ourselves over to these things. But we do need to recognize at the same time to the degree that we are influenced by these things and controlled by these things, to that degree we will be weakened and our faith will be weakened and our sight of the reality of the things which the Lord tells us in His Word are true will be dim. Our love for God will be compromised and as a result, ultimately our desire to reach out to the lost won't be as strong and won't be as urgent as it might otherwise be. And so what is it that we need to do? Well, the first thing we need to do is obey the first part of the commandment. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence of your flesh. Don't be desiring the world. You need to put those desires, Paul tells us quite plainly in Romans 8.13, to death. They cannot live within us. So we need to put those things off and put them to death. But secondly, we need to obey the second part of the commandment. We need to be filled with the Spirit. And again, that's not going to happen unless we do the first part. Now, Paul, when he says be filled with the Spirit, we need to understand that in the same sense in which he tells us not to be filled with wine, except we are not to think of the Holy Spirit as some kind of spiritual liquid that the Lord pours into our souls that we can have, as it were, more or less of. Okay, my toes are filled with the Spirit or my legs are filled or something like that or my soul is partially filled. It really has to do with control. It has to do with influence. It has to do with how much we have yielded ourselves to the Lord. We are not to be under the power or under the control of sin under the spell of this world, seeking great things from men, seeking honor from them. But we are to be controlled and led by the Holy Spirit, seeking the things above, seeking the honor that comes from God, which we can only do if we will allow the Spirit of God to influence us in this way. And yes, there is a real sense in which we must allow Him. We can resist Him, and we must not resist Him. We must yield to him. Now the Lord originally gave us his spirit to give us spiritual sight. We were blind. He gave us the spirit to open our eyes and to show us the, the reality of those things which we thought were foolishness. The kingdom of God in Jesus Christ to show us that Jesus is the door as we saw earlier in our meditation. In John 3 verse 3. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Spirit of God is the one who opened our eyes to the reality of these things originally. He also gave us the Spirit, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, when he redeemed us in order to free us from those enemies I've just been talking about. 
from the world and from our flesh. Remember that the world basically wouldn't have any power over us unless, it was, unless, we, unless the flesh were there. Uh, the fact that we have this desire for sinful things makes the world attractive to us. If we didn't have it, it wouldn't hold any allurement to us at all, which is why when the Spirit of God comes into our lives, He frees us from the flesh. He frees us from our sins. We read in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death and we do need to understand what he means by that is this principle that the Spirit of God implants in our hearts sets us free from that old principle that was there which we call the old man the old nature that corruption having this new principle in our souls uh, that is of the Spirit a new desire for holiness a desire for the things that the Lord promises the things which are above the things which we despise before having given us this desire that was all that was needed in order to break the power that sin had over us, to break the power of the flesh so that we might be free from the temptation, well, not the temptation, ultimately or, or absolutely, but from the bondage we were in, desiring the things of the world that simply the flesh wanted. Now we are free to obey Him. So that's what the Spirit of God did when He came. He gave us spiritual sight and He freed us from sin. But now if we want these things to be stronger because these things basically are on a sliding scale depending upon how well we're doing with the first part of the commandments and how much we're actually yielding to the Spirit of God. You see, if we want that to be stronger, we have to do both of these things. We have to resist and we have to yield. We have to yield. We have to let him control us. We have to let him influence us. We need to yield to those desires that he has put within our hearts. Again, Stuart Alliott in that um, sermon lectures he was talking about as far as being free from sin, being free from the flesh, being able to obey the Lord. What do we have to do? Well, we have to resist sin and we have to yield to the Spirit. The Spirit of God is a, an active desire within our hearts to do what is right, to do what is good, to do what it is the Lord commands us to do. All of us who are believers have that desire, but we can either resist it or we can surrender to it if we will surrender to Him. Not only will it strengthen our ability to see which the Lord gave us originally. But we will have increased power to overcome our flesh so that the world will not have as much power over us so that we will be able to reach out more effectively. In other words, seeing what we will see more clearly will have more power because the motives will, will create, will have more effect on us. We'll have greater power to do what the Lord calls us to do, which is why Paul writes in Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. Now we do need to understand that what we're looking at are basically two commands. The command to walk by the Spirit and the command to be filled with the Spirit, to be under His control. If we don't do these things, if we don't listen to these commands, which the Lord commands us for our good, if we, if we don't yield to Him, we're not going to be able to do what He made us to do, what He redeemed us to do, what He has given us, again, the great privilege and honor to do, which is to reach out to our neighbors for their good, for their salvation and for the Lord's glory. So let me just close by saying this. The Lord wants us to enter into a virtuous circle. We so often walk in the vicious circle. We, we yield to the, to the flesh and we resist the spirit. And as a result, we are continually weakened 
from what we might otherwise have, but the Spirit's power and ability. It makes it so weak, His influence so weak, that we, we find that we're struggling even to do the basic things the Lord calls us to do. If we want the kind of power that is available to us through the Spirit of God, we need to walk in a more virtuous circle. We need to instead yield to the Spirit and resist the flesh. If we do that, we will have a stronger faith. We'll have a stronger work of the Spirit of God in our souls, a clearer sight of what it is that we're all about and what we're doing and why we need to do these things. And we'll have a greater power to be able to reach out. So let's just from this, let's carry this away this evening, that the Lord calls us to fight against the flesh, not to yield to it, not to give in to it, not to, to continually embrace the world and the things of the world that stir up our flesh, but to recognize the flesh for what it is. It's rebellion against God. It's, it's hatred against God. It is everything that the Spirit of God was put in us to resist. We need to see it as such, and we need to resist it. If we don't, we will be perpetually weak. But we also need to yield to the Spirit of God. How do we know what the Spirit of God is moving us to do? Read the Bible, see what it is that the Lord commands you to do. That's what the Spirit of God is moving you to do, and that is what you need to yield to as He gives you that desire. And if you will do those things, you will grow in your desire to reach the lost. You will grow in your ability, in your power, in your courage to be able to do that. That is what you will want because the Spirit's influence in you will be stronger. You'll want to do everything in your power to glorify the one who loved you and laid his life down for you and to reach out to your neighbor and love them with the same kind of love that you love yourself. Again, which are the greatest commandments that the Lord gives to us. Now again, we do need to take this seriously. There is a connection between how well we do here and how strong we're going to be. If we will do this, we will grow in strength and we will be able to more greatly honor and glorify our Savior. So may the Lord give us uh, the grace to do that. Uh, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and ask for God's grace and strength.